Hello, I'm sharing a uh, sigmoid resection for a distal sigmoid cancer um, with a anastomotic revision at the end. Um, usually for malignancies, I do medial to lateral. This patient has some adherence of a sigmoid colon to some um, inguinal hernia mesh, and this was precluding my ability to lift the IMA pedicle upwards, and therefore I'm doing a limited um, mobilization here just so that I can get this uh, down and then lift the pedicle. You can actually see that there's a wad of epipoic fat inside of a kind of a, a peritoneal hernia defect. And I'm working on getting that down. Once that's down, I'll go ahead and start my medial to lateral. Favorable body habitus in this patient made for a uh, a more easy surgery, particularly compared to a lot of the diverticulitis cases that I've been doing a lot of lately. And we'll just work our way underneath the IMA pedicle here, sweeping the nerves posteriorly, and then coming up <clears throat> along the IMA pedicle back to the aorta. Um, for cancer cases, I usually make every attempt I can to take the IMA pedicle um, proximal to the left colix. I've isolated that here. Um, and I try to make a, a nice window around the pedicle. I really like to clean a lot of the fat off of the vessel before I take it to make sure I get a good seal, particularly with that warning that we've heard about lately with the vessel sealer. I think it's a good practice to do this. Take the tension off and divide the IMA. And then I'll do a little more of my medial dissection. You can see the ureter there posteriorly that I'm sweeping down. and then do a little bit of a uh, TME dissection in the upper rectum since I know that I'm going to need to go to the upper rectum um, for my uh, distal margin. Once I feel like I've done enough of a medial dissection, I'll put a sponge back there to protect the ureter and I'll go ahead and start the lateral dissection. Typically, when a patient doesn't have the adherence that goes all the way up the left side wall, you would have already meet, met your medial dissection, but with this patient's adherence from that previous uh, hernia mesh, I had to work a little bit further down to join that medially dissected plane, but I'm going to come into that pretty soon. Right there. And you see how that sponge, uh, being a marker over the ureter, helps protect you. Um, I don't tend to use uh, ureteral stents for uh, patients uh, without uh, diverticulitis and primary surgeries unless there's something on the CAT scan that shows me either with the tumor or otherwise uh, near our ureter. Now I'm just doing some uh, lateral mobilization. I find that you can do this very quickly with the vessel sealer compared to uh, scissors. I'm just getting right in the plane uh, along Tolt's fascia right there, a couple of spreads, and then burn. Um, I am a selective splenic flexure mobilizer, um, as you know from a lot of my videos, so I will go until I think that I have uh, minimal tension. Um, with the port setup that I have right here, despite being in steep Trendelenburg, if I had needed to come out and around the flexure, I would have been able to do it without um, redocking or repositioning the patient, um, which I think is very helpful for people like me who have lack of patience to do those things. Um, but I'm working my way up. I'm nearly at the flexure right here. That is, actually was the spleen right there you saw. That is the spleen. Um, I did a little bit more. I did not do a full mobilization, but I am assessing my tension right now and I feel like I've got really good length. So I'm going to go ahead and take my mesentery to the proximal margin. Um, I did not take the IMV in this case, also for uh, length purposes. I felt like I had a, a really nice mesentery clearance and didn't need the extra lymph node tissue just to get the length, so I left the IMV. Um, this patient did have uh, 36 nodes in their specimen. 
Um, two of them were positive. After I take the pos uh, proximal margin, I'll go ahead and take the distal margin. That tattoo is about six centimeters or more distal to the tumor. Um, there was comment on the colonoscopy, although when I did a flex sig, I didn't see it myself that there was a separate um, polyp distal to the cancer, which is in the vicinity of where the tattoo is, and that was not removed because at the time of this patient's colonoscopy, they were on anticoagulation, so the uh, doctor left it alone, but I just decided I needed to get below the tattoo in order to get that separate polyp out, and that's what I'm doing now by clearing the distal margin. So I avoid EEA staplers. It's just a personal preference, and um, I do mostly intracorporeal anastomoses, um, particularly because I'm avoiding the EEA, and uh, I like to sew. So my plan here for a cancer case, I don't open... Uh, I try not to open the bowel that has the tumor segment within it. So my plan is, is to distally staple, proximally staple, have an isolated segment of colon with cancer in it, and then I was going to do my sewn two-layer anastomosis, which you've seen many times, and you'll see that there was an issue with it that needed to be revised. Had the patient's tumor and the mesentery been less bulky, I would have attempted a transrectal extraction of the entire specimen, um, his, uh, I didn't think uh, I would have been able to get out without any uh, tearing of the specimen or of the rectum, so I made no attempts to do that. So proximal and distal staple. I'm very happy with the flow of the case right now. I'm literally just at around one hour um, of docked time, and now I'm setting up uh, the anastomosis that I have come to really enjoy. Uh, I have posted on other sites uh, within the last couple of months where I actually did need to revise the uh, anastomosis, um, and you'll see why, because this is the second time that this has happened to me in several hundred of these um, anastomoses. Um, but I think that this case speaks to how we should not ever leave the operating room until we are 100% satisfied with the way things look. Um, don't put the patient at risk for things that we know that we can do better. And you'll see in just a second exactly what I'm talking about. So that's a 309 inch V-lock. And now I make a proctotomy and enterotomy. Um, about, I try to leave at least five millimeters of tissue between the otomy and the staple line. And I try not to go too far lateral because I feel like that can, that's actually what cuts off the blood supply from coming around laterally and perfusing that lip of mucosa. Um, I have received many comments about people who ask me if I've been nervous about this uh, and that lip of mucosa, and honestly, until these last two cases, which are separated by about two months, it's never been a concern for me, particularly using ICG, because I always see it enhance, um, and I've never been concerned that it uh, had become ischemic. So I'm just making my colotomy a little bit larger. I'm happy with how things look. I always do perfusion again. In my previous anastomosis that I needed to revise, it was the rectal lip of mucosa and serosa between the otomy and uh, the staple line and the proctotomy. In this case, believe it or not, it's the colon side. So you can see on the rectal side that lip still lights up nicely, but on the colon side, it doesn't at all. Um, under white light, I don't think I would have noticed a difference at all. Um, but with ICG, I can absolutely tell this isn't good. I'm actually poking a blood vessel with the needle right there to see if I can get it to bleed, and there's nothing. And I will not accept that, despite the fact that this would have been a two-layer anastomosis. I'm not leaving that. So I'm now going to convert this to an end-to-end -end anastomosis, um, which is what I did the first time that I ran into this trouble and then I sew an end-to-end -end anastomosis. I'll take the time to comment right now that I am very happy with both uh, two-layer and single-layer anastomoses uh, in this region. I don't think that one has advantages over the other. Um, certainly the single layer is faster. I will say that anecdotally I think two layers makes me feel more secure. I do think that it imbricates a lot more tissue and early after surgery you theoretically could have 
a more stenotic anastomosis, although clinically in several hundred patients that I've given that anastomosis, I've never had that be an issue. So taking the mesentery with the vessel sealer and taking the bowel wall with the scissors, I've already divided the proximal side, and now I'm getting ready to divide the distal side. And I'll finish that off with uh, the scissors. I'll go ahead and extract that little piece uh, through the rectum. Label that as uh, anastomosis. It also serves as a new proximal and distal margin. Um, that's my specimen. I was just looking one more time saying, nope, that's definitely not going to be ready for a transrectal extraction. Now I'm checking my tension. I'm very happy with how it looks. Um, and now I'm going to sew my uh, two layer, excuse me, my single layer end to end anastomosis. I'm starting here. Um, by doing one 3 v lock, uh, excuse me, one 3 silk directly posterior um, just to line up the midline. And the other thing that I feel that this does is it will, um, it will cause the mucosa of the posterior lip to stay um, inwards so that when you start sewing your end to end, it should, um, keep the mucosa inverted very similarly uh, to what ends up happening when I do my um, canal over the top. Checking ICG again, make sure I'm not going to do any revisions. You can see how the mucosa is pooched upwards now because of that 3-0 stitch in the back. Um, I'm not saying that you have to do that. I've just, I've done it both ways and I, I like doing it with more than without. And now I start posteriorly. This is a 3-0 inch V-lock. I'm sewing um, out and around the patient's left hand side to start. You see I kind of suture with both my left and my right hands based upon whatever gives me the better angle. Um, I have not really had much of a issue doing that even though that's the fenestrated bipolar and not a second needle driver. It tends to work adequately enough. Just getting the looping out of the suture and continuing on my way. And right about here, I'm going to get ready to start canaling. So right there, I turn the needle around uh, to bring it to the outside, and I'm going to canal over the top. I don't bring this too far in the beginning because I don't want to close that anterior lip and not be able to see the posterior aspect of the anastomosis, which I now started my second 3-0 V-lock in the posterior midline. And I'm going to bring this out and around the right side. Again, whichever gives me the better angle, left hand or right hand, is how I'm going to take my bite. I do wonder prior to ICG if I saw an anastomosis like this and I did not revise it, if it clinically would have been insignificant. Um, I truly don't have the answer to that. I just don't have the courage to have le left something like that. Um, as we all know, if we had and then the patient suffered a complication, I don't think any of us would be able to sleep at night knowing that we had the opportunity to make it better. You know, these cases are often frustrating because you know that you're in for another, you know, 30 minutes or so. Um, you've got another case pending. you got to get home, you know, whatever it is. But, you know, we're there to make sure that we do a perfectly expert job for our patients. So I think that we should take the time to do it right. Um, I like to bring the sutures towards the midline uh, for tying. I don't like to... Uh, um, tie over towards a corner, so that's why I went back to the other suture now that I finished my posterior row. <coughs> I don't think that there's any perfect um, anastomosis 
whether you use an EEA stapler, which you know that I'm averse to, or if you do a single layer or a double layer or whatever stitch you use, I think that inherently there can be issues with every single one of them. I think that we should all be comfortable with numerous different techniques of anastomoses. We should all have our preference of what we like to do, but be ready to switch to something else um, if that's what the case calls for. So I'm almost done bringing these uh, two sutures together. The patient otherwise uh, has remained very stable on the table um, and postoperatively did very well and um, was discharged on post-op A2 so that I could observe when I restarted the anticoagulation that there was no concerns for bleeding. Um, if I had any concerns for any uh, defects in the anastomosis with that single layer, I absolutely would do another interrupted 3.0 with any residual V-lock suture that I had or uh, with the 3.0 silk. In this case, I didn't feel that there was any need for an additional suture. I'm doing my leak test. Drive my scope up and through that anastomosis. Uh, this is a 19 millimeter rigid sigmoidoscope. Uh, no bubbles, no bleeding, and wide open. No drain. Um, after I undock laparoscopically before I remove the needles, I'll put some momentum in the pelvis. I hope you enjoyed.